I was asked to respond to the question, will open access save libraries? Uh, and, I, and I think that's an interesting question because it assumes that libraries need to be saved from something. Um, and so I, I was prompted by that question to ask myself, you know, what is it that might be threatening libraries? And as someone with uh, long experience managing and administrating in libraries, there are a few things that come to mind as possible or, or potential threats to libraries integrity or sustainability. Uh, one of them would be the rising cost of content. Um, another would be declining support from host institutions. And a third might be the low use of library services or content by patrons. And so I want to address those in reverse order. Um, so as for low use, this is actually not an issue at any academic library that I'm aware of. Certainly uh, usage patterns are changing with uh, use of space and of online materials continuing to be very strong while use of printed materials and things like in-person reference service uh, tending to be falling or stagnant. But the use of libraries overall that, and their services- uh, I'm still listening, but I'm not on the camera. Remains very strong. Um, so here, there doesn't seem to be any need for open access to save us. Um, lack of institutional support. Uh, here, here, the picture is much more mixed. In the US, Investment in libraries has been falling as a percentage of campus spending for years, and this affects us in a number of ways. Uh, deferred maintenance on buildings, lengthening replacement cycles for capital equipment, shrinking staff, uh, and of course collections that can't keep pace with the combination of an exploding volume of scholarly content and aggressive publisher price increases, to which we'll come back in a second. Um, but I want to emphasize that this picture isn't consistent everywhere. There are some institutions that invest much more deeply and carefully in their libraries than others do. But overall, I think it's fair to say that declining institutional support is a potential threat to libraries' ability to keep doing what their host institutions depend on them to do. Of these three threats, though, I think the rising cost of content relative to budgets is the most universal one and the most pressing. And it's here, of course, that open access provides the most obvious chance of salvation. Uh, it seems intuitively obvious that the more scholarly information becomes free, the less pressure there should be on library budgets. But of course, the reality is a lot more complicated than that. Um, for one thing, the more information becomes free, the less obvious need there is for a library's host institution to keep giving it money, or at least to keep giving the library money for the purpose of buying content. And buying content is typically one of the biggest investments that an institution makes in its library. Um, of course, if all content became free tomorrow and then the library lost its collections budget, it wouldn't have lost any of its ability to do its work. But that's clearly not what's going to happen because 20 years after the Berlin Declaration on Open Access, we're still grappling with all the same pricing dynamics that we were dealing with 20 years before that declaration. Instead, what's happening is that OA initiatives are leading us to spend collections money on new things like underwriting APCs and supporting initiatives like Knowledge Unlatched and Scope 3 while still having to pay for journals, books, and databases. So far, OA is doing a much better job of adding new and free content to the scholarly ecosystem than it is of slowing the rate of price increase for the journals and databases that we've been subscribing to for decades. Now, what some libraries would really like to do, and, and some are actually doing it in varying degrees, is take the money that they've been using to buy content and repurpose it for the support of open access publishing. And this, repurpose, this repurposing uh, can take any number of forms, some of them more radical than others. So for example, when a library carves out some of its collections budget and uses it to pay uh, APCs on behalf of faculty who want to publish in OA journals, they're doing this kind of repurposing in uh, a relatively small scale way. When they join an initiative like Knowledge Unlatched or Scope 3, paying money from their collections budgets to underwrite the creation of third party OA content, they're doing this repurposing in a larger scale way. And when they enter into transformative agreements with publishers, especially large publishers like Elsevier or Wiley, they're repurposing their collections money at an even larger scale. Now it's worth pointing out that none of these kinds of initiatives does anything to reduce the impact of price increases on the participating library's budget, but they do help foster a more open publishing environment, one in which pricing pressure should, theoretically at least, eventually ease for the library community as a whole. 
But here's where the issues of pricing and institutional support start to dovetail. Because the library's institutional host doesn't usually just give the library a bunch of money and say, do whatever you want with it. This is especially the case when it comes to collections funding. When a college or university gives the library money with which to buy content, the expectation is that the library will use it to buy content that costs money, not to pay for content that's available for free with the intention of underwriting its publishing costs so that it can remain free for everyone. This is where the very important concept of institutional alignment comes in. If you're a decision maker in the library and you're thinking about using collections money for the purpose of underwriting open access, it's a very good idea to make sure that that plan is in alignment with the goals and priorities of the institution that is providing that money to you. It may be that your institution will think this is a great idea and will wholeheartedly support you. It's also possible that your institution will have questions or concerns or even that it won't support you at all in that goal. I would suggest that the best and wisest course is to find this out before you start redirecting your collections budget. A much less wise course of action would be to start redirecting institutional money away from its intended purposes and then wait for your institution to find out and see whether your institution objects. Now, getting into alignment with your institution doesn't necessarily mean changing your plans. It may be that your uh, provost or vice president needs to be educated about the benefits of OA, and once she is, she'll fully support you in using collections money to underwrite it. But it's also possible that she does understand OA perfectly well and still prefers that you use the institution's money for other worthy purposes, at which point you'll have some choices to make. We all need to be careful to avoid the arrogant assumption that those who disagree with us on an issue must disagree because they don't understand it as well as we do. It can be easy to forget this in the current social and political environment, but sometimes it actually is possible for two people to be equally well informed about what's going on in the world and still come to different conclusions as to what should be done about it. Now, I've noticed something interesting whenever this issue has come up in conversations with my colleagues. I find that very often when I raise the issue of institutional alignment, my colleagues respond with irritation or even anger. What about our obligation to the larger scholarly community? They'll ask me, don't we have the right or even the ethical duty to use our resources to change and improve the scholarly system as a whole? The problem with this response is that unless the library is in the very unusual situation of having an independent source of funding, it isn't using its own resources at all. It's using the resources of a host institution that has entrusted those resources to the library with the expectation that they'll be used to meet local institutional needs. If we're gonna talk about ethics, and I believe we should, then one of the first ethical questions we need to address is, to what degree is it appropriate for me to use someone else's money in ways that they don't intend me to use it? In any case, what all this suggests is that the question, will OA save libraries, is much more complicated than its simple formulation is designed to suggest. The answer is it depends. And what it depends on varies greatly from situation to situation. I would suggest that what's much more likely than OA to save your library is keeping your library in careful strategic alignment with the institution that created it and which your library exists to support. Wow, thanks a lot, Rick. That was an interesting one. And we already have the first question. This time it's not mine, but uh, Bas Staub is asking. Um, hi, Bas. So, Hanna, why don't you take that? Otherwise, it sounds like self interest if I'm phrasing this question. Yeah, of course. So, <laughs> or Bas non interest, asking... rather. <laughs> <laughs> Bas is asking um, regarding your comment about using collection funds to underwrite publishing fees. Am I right in hearing that you see a model like Knowledge Unlatched as somewhat under threat? Yeah, I, I, I can't really speak to the degree to which the Knowledge Unlatched model is, uh, is sustainable. Certainly so far, Knowledge Unlatched has managed to stay afloat for, you know, for several years. Um, whether, whether it can grow to a significant degree, uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a market analyst. Uh, but I, I do think that I do think that the, 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 the type of model that knowledge unlatched is built on um, is one that, that that runs the risk of appearing sustainable in the short run 
while libraries jump on board and then um, runs the risk of, uh, of turning out not to be sustainable in the long run as the library's institutions start to figure out what they're doing. Um, again, you know, to, to the degree that the institutions, that the, the libraries host institutions think that a model like, like KU's is, is great, then it'll do just fine. Um, but one of, one, of the, one of my cardinal rules of library leadership is, is that if you're, if you're doing something in your library that is succeeding because the, the university administration doesn't know you're doing it, that thing that you're doing is doomed in the long run. Um, and that, that goes to my larger point about institutional alignment. So, so what do you think is, is the answer then? I mean, do institutions need more information about open access and about the evolving ecosystem of academic publishing or do they have different priorities than um, other players in the industry perhaps? I mean, it seems like there's sometimes a, you know, as you were saying, they're not aligned always. Yeah, and, and sometimes it is true that the institution needs to understand um, open access better, needs to understand the dynamics of the scholarly communication ecosystem better. And if they did understand it better, then, then the institution would agree more with the libraries uh, or with you know, the particular librarian's goals. Uh, but sometimes they, they, do understand, they do understand these things quite well and they just disagree. Uh, about how the money should be used. One of the things that we need to bear in mind is that while, while open access is, is, a very worthy, uh, is a very worthy goal, it's not the only worthy goal out there. And all institutions are dealing with strictly limited resources. So when, when the library proposes that, you know, $100,000 of institutional funds be used to support OA publishing, um, in the in, in from the library's perspective, that might seem like a very obviously worthy way to spend hundred thousand dollars. The institution might agree that that's a worthy way to do it, but the institution might also be saying, of course, with that hundred thousand dollars, we could also provide two scholarships to first generation college students, refurbish our physics lab, um, you know, do any number of other things that are also worthy. So the institution has to make tough decisions about what's the best way to allocate that money.